paper, and I'm going to be handing them around for you to look at, rather than having them up nicely on the screen. So if you will just come so you can uh, see the illustrations as close as uh, we can. Um, I'm inviting people forward because the, the illustrations are on paper and I'm going to be handling, handing them around. Uh, yeah, okay. after all those nibs, you need some water. <laughs> you want me to stay in front of the camera? So it's maddening of you. No, no, I'll run the illustrations for you. Thank you. Okay. The title of this panel is The Clothing of the Times, and clothing is what we are talking about rather than fashion. How people covered a human body, a human body that basically consists of a torso with a head, two arms, and two legs. No tails, we're not no wearing tails. <laughs> And we are starting with a painting that is entitled A Boor Asleep. A boor at this time is a countryman, a peasant, a farmer. And if you look at him, you see him in Stop. the very basic Stop. clothing of the period, which has no element of fashion whatsoever. He is wearing a loose shirt, a pair of narrow-legged work pants, that, do, that seem to be sort of undone as he relaxes. Uh, yeah, well, they, they were doable. Uh, this is part of the, th look at the clothing, not on the design, on uh, the situation, and uh, soft leather shoes. Okay, why isn't he wearing the full pants that were fashionable at the time? Because they were dangerous when you were working with animals and machinery. Uh, just as this would never work when I'm dealing with power tools. When I am working on making miniatures, this gets fastened up there. The last place I want it ending up is in their motor, to motor tool. You have any idea how it hurts if you get your pigtail caught in a motor tool. Uh, the same is true of this. Those full pants that were men's fashion at the time did not percolate down to the work clothes of the average person. The, re the color on that is also reasonably good. The shirt is unbleached. It was expensive that to color. bleach fabric until it was white. It took days and days out in the summer sun, soaking it in buttermilk, spreading it on the grass. Natural color for linen was much cheaper. Similarly, the pants are a kind of orangey to mustard color. Orangey to mustard to olive green were the cheapest dyes available at the time, and therefore cheap fabric uh, tended to get done in cheap dyes. We'll come to woad as we get to the blues. He does have a nice red hat. I yes, he does have a nice red hat. Which is probably uh, more expensive than anything else he has I'm on. And I'm handing around now uh, several more illustrations of men, many of them portrayed in taverns because the painters tended to portray uh, lower class men as they met in taverns. They held still longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, it was a, how they could sell the paintings. Uh, and I wanted uh, color on this as much as I could uh, get it. Uh, your common 
the illustrations of ordinary people at this time are drawings, uh, charcoal drawings, pen and ink drawings, pencil drawings, uh, but they, they don't give an idea of culture, color. Now, as this clothing goes around, all of them have the common element of the narrow-legged work pants, because it was important that the not get you into danger, and the uh, basic doublet. The doublet will be coming up as the phenomenon. The doublet for men's clothing came basically in two forms, with sleeves and without sleeves. That's it. Central front closing. In 2007, my daughter-in-law and I took off for Europe. And one of the places we visited was the Textile Museum in Colmar. It's a lovely museum. We spent two days in the Textile Museum in Colmar. Part of the illustration they had up was a men's sleeveless doublet from the 17th century and a quilt. It was a quilted doublet for warmth in winter, and a contemporary Pierre Cardin ski jacket, ski vest. There was essentially no difference in the style. They both had the narrow collar, they both had the sleeveless, they had the front closing, and they were both padded. The only difference was that the padding in the Cardin was uh, artificial, whereas the padding in that would have been natural fiber. But essentially, one could have been interchanged with the other and nobody would blink. It was an item of clothing. To a certain extent, it could be made into an item of fashion, but only by ornamentation. The vest that a, the doublet, the sleeveless doublet or the vest that a wealthy man wore would have been of a better fabric, a brighter dye, probably embroidered, fancier buttons, but that was really all you could do it with it. You could ornament it, you could trim it, but you didn't change the basic cut of what was there, and this is ubiquitous. You dig them up out of sewers in Elizabethan London. Uh, they're all, they were all over the place. They were simply an item of clothing, a basic item of clothing. Now, Eric has put into canon that most people couldn't have afford to have more than one set of clothes. This is canon in the 1632 series, but alas, it is wrong. <laughs> not the first time. <laughs> no, not or the, the first last time, time. Or the only time. People had many fewer clothes than we do today. And they had ordinary people less frequently brand new clothes than we do today. The 17th century had a very lively trade in secondhand clothing. The towns, the villages were full of the equivalent of Goodwill, thrift shops, consignment shops, the people who 
could afford to buy their clothes new, wore them until they started to get shabby. That is, when you hear, for the early modern period, the statement, people wore their clothes until they were rags, <laughs> we should modify that. Clothes were worn by someone until they were sold as rags. But they might very well go through three, four, or five increasingly poor owners before they got to the point of being pitched into somebody's rag box. Take, for instance, contracts for the clothing of apprentices. Almost every contract for the clothing of an apprentice required that the master should furnish the boy with one full set of new clothing per year. Did he wear this to work? No. What he wore to work was hand-me-down clothes from one of the older apprentices that had been a new suit four or five apprentices ago for the simple reason that boys who are apprenticed at 12, by the time they finish their apprenticeship at 17 or 18, are a very different size. And every master with a workshop had a trunk full of outgrown clothes. And for dirty jobs, messy jobs, jobs that were likely to end up in rips, tears, and mending, what the guy, kid was dressed in was somebody else's outgrown clothes, where he had his required new set of clothes available for wearing to church, to the kermess, to when he was being shown off by the master and the mistress. So my next set here is of peasants who are having parties, peasants who are dressed up one way or the other. The first one is a street party out in the countryside. That one happens to be English. That's illustrations of a party in front of the Swan Tavern uh, in London. <coughs> this next one, actually both of them, one of them's a detail and one of them is a larger <coughs> one, are illustrations from a painting of a barn dance. You think that American pioneers invented barn dances? No. Let's <laughs> think again. Uh, this is a barn dance. Somebody asked me, how did people socialize at the time? Basically, they had parties. And if you want to know how many parties they had and how many lively the parties got, all you really have to do is read the outraged sermons of the more uptight pastors who <laughs> were railing against what had gone on at the local barn dance the weekend before the sermon was being issued. So this basically is rural clothing from the work